I am a proud young Irish man in Ulster's hills. My life began a happy boy through green fields ran and kept God's and man's laws. But when my age was barely ten, my country's wrongs were told again by tens of thousands marching men and my heart stirred to the cause so I'll wear no convict uniform nor meekly serve my time that Britain might Grand Ireland's fight, eight hundred years of crime. Well, I suppose it's been in my head for maybe five or six years. Uh, footed about with it, did some interviews, had bits and pieces lying about. And then what happened uh, was I realised we'll come to the 30th anniversary. You know, it, I, I realised that it's history. You know, 30 years is history. You know, there's, there's people who weren't born, lots of people who weren't born then. And I, I think there's a deficit of uh, Republican writing about these things. I know, you know, the next generation up from me, and I'm not in that field, but the next generation up from me, uh, have, you know, they're dying off. Uh, there's a great reluctance amongst Republicans to talk about uh, the conflict, or at least to loose talk about the conflict, I think maybe the best way to put it. And um, I think it's a terrible loss because then we're, we're, there's waves of history we're missing told by people who were involved in all of that. And this was a huge event, you know. Uh, the atmosphere was uh, within two years of 10 comrades down. Uh, the effect that had on people inside jail and also people out, and of course on their families. But in the overall struggle, the uh, hunger strike was looked upon as a watershed. Uh, I, I, at, at a great depth, if you like, it was a loss of, you know, leaders because these are the type of people who were leading the struggle and in, in all struggles and all conflicts you will lose your best leaders. And then Republicans, Republican prisoners uh, and Republicans in general did what they always do. Uh, they said, OK, we've lost 10 comrades. Uh, the prison struggle is not over and neither is the overall struggle. So what do we do now? And there was a slogan at the time which was smash hates blocks. And, you know, to give the atmosphere just by us in mind without you know, putting too fine a point on it. It was, it was five and six years. Some prisoners had been on protest for five and six years. There was systematic brutality. I mean, you couldn't go out of your cell to go to mass, to go to the toilet, uh, to go to a visit without getting uh, brutalised. And then there was raids which, which were involved in brutalisation. And an escape was sort of unheard of, well it wasn't unheard of in Republican history, but I mean it was, an, it was, it was not within the thoughts of the British administration. They thought, they boasted practically this was the most secure prison in Europe. And people sat about changing in the atmosphere. Um, Larry Marley, for instance, was one of the first ones up in what was called the task force. They were sent up until mixed wings, uh, you know, from the protest blocks until what, what were called conforming blocks, although they didn't go up to conform. And they were reorganising, basically, Republican prisoners throughout the jail. And instead of it being a situation where you had, I mean, you had hundreds of Republican prisoners in, but in actual fact, if you were naked in a cell, you know, or even alone in a cell, it was one person against whatever number of prison waters were put in to you. This changed the situation where people were out, they had free association, were running about. And it was really, what do we do now? How do we advance the struggle? and escape. I mean, it's all, I, I, I assume that it's in everybody's mind, but certainly in my mind, I always had two, uh, uh, um, two driving forces, if you like, while I was in jail. And at this stage, I was in over 10 years. One was education and the other one was to escape. I tried to escape on a number of occasions before. I had escaped once before, but I had a number of failures as well. So uh, um, when this came up and when we started developing it and when 
more and more of the detail come in. I just remember that I had more and more of a, a confidence in it. And, um, and that was it. It was part of struggle. It wasn't just an escape. It was the hit back at the British administration after they had uh, um, put, you know, basically 10 men to death in, on hunger strike. And uh, that's what we were trying to do. And of course it was to rejoin the struggle and, you know, practically everybody who got out did rejoin the struggle. How long was the escape in the plan, Jerry? And um, how difficult was it to keep it under wraps, given the strategy that you were intending to adapt? Well, it, it, it was a mass escape. And the idea at the start was not necessarily that it was hit seven or a single block. Larry Marley used to say, you know, it's good, it's good to have any escape. It's good to get a person out, but think big. It would be massive to empty the camp. And as information came in, there was a group set up, there was an escape committee set up under Larry Marley. Um, as, as information came in, there was different plans to ship. You know, they gathered all the bits and pieces they had, like buttons, uh, um, bits of uniform, uh, chisels, you know, coal chisels, uh, um, um, digging tools, all of that. And, and maps and all the rest to pull them together and then they said, okay, what have we got here? And then a, a plan started to form. Once, once it was taken over a block, we knew it was dangerous. Um, this is a jail within a jail. So H block seven is actually a self-contained jail in itself as each block is. Then you were in a phase and that phase was within, was within the bigger jail and then the bigger jail was within the British uh, Mil uh, Ministry of Defence. Uh, plus a, a British army uh, um, camp actually sitting right beside it. So it was within all of that. Uh, there's armed guards on the outside. So we knew once, you know, to take the circle area or the administration area, it was almost a, a prisoner free, free zone. It, it was hard to get out there, although we, over a period of time, we worked on how we would get out there. The wings were going to be taken easy enough because we had, we had power of numbers. But once you went into the circle, you had to be able to take it very quickly. So we knew that guns were necessary. And once uh, guns were necessary, uh, once guns were part of the plan, we knew that any loose talk, any idea that the British would know that there were guns in there, then obviously they had a shoot to kill policy, which they had used many times, they would have used it there. So it was really maximum security uh, type of operation that was uh, a need to know basis. So people didn't know until it was necessary for them to know. There were some complicated briefs in it. Some people had to change uh, from one project to another as the escape you know, went from the block to the main uh, gate area to the, you know, the, the, the British camp, the British army camp and that. And therefore some knew about it uh, longer than others, but very tight, very tight. And that's, that's the reason it worked. And one of the other reasons was we emphasized on the escape you know, this is your part to play in this escape. Don't worry about anybody else's. You play your part and then it'll be okay.